I'm going to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we're all on today. And in Brisbane, it's the Turrbal and Yagaru people. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that these lands have always been places of teaching, research and learning. Welcome everybody to Tea and Buns. Tea and Buns is a community. I try and do it as often as I can throughout the year, mostly monthly, but not always. Um, but really, I usually try and talk about some topical issues or research that we've been doing either at QT or around the globe. And I typically speak to one person, but today we've got four guest speakers here. But this is a community which means that everybody here online, it is it is your space to ans ask questions, to get involved in the conversation. So it's not a webinar. I really want to stress that it's not a webinar, it's a conversation. And that's what we're going to have this morning. So please feel free to uh, use the chat to share your ideas, your perspectives, your questions. I will try and monitor the chat as best as I can to make sure that I'm not going to miss anything. Um, but I know there's some really lovely people on the line like Eliza and uh, Catherine who are also my friends and colleagues who are going to monitor the chat for me as well. Please, Eliza, All right? If I miss anything, um, let me know and, and we'll make sure that your questions are answered um, by the panel. So the Team Buns is really a, a way for us to talk about topical issues and because it's National Volunteer Week, we are going to talk about the National Strategy for Volunteering, which was recently launched in the earlier part of this year. And we thought what an amazing opportunity to really talk about the issues. And I can already see from many of you introducing yourself that you are already involved in volunteering or you are part of Peak Bodies. This is probably your world. So uh, we're not going to try it. We, we want to answer questions that are really pertinent and, and topical for you and find out what it is that you'd like to hear, particularly from Sarah, but also Brad, Tanya and Melanie, who are all going to talk this morning. So because this is a discussion, I thought we would kick off with a real quick question. And the first question I would love you to put in the chat is what do you think the benefits of volunteering are? I know I'm talking to everybody who knows a lot about the benefits, but I really want to hit, do this as a quick brainstorm because there has been research done on the benefits of volunteering and I just want to know what you think. So pop your, if you can you find the chat. Great, so Ruth says social connections. What do you think the benefits of volunteering are from your perspective and the work that you've done around Australia? wherever you're based. That's fantastic. Okay, I can see lots of wonderful ideas there, giving back, being able to express yourself, personal satisfaction, health, growth, contributing to the community, well-being, love it. Impact on mental health, good, having a purpose in life. Yes. Yes, so many benefits. And if we work in the space of volunteering, then we see that often on a day-to-day -day basis when we interact with volunteers. Um, and it is really lovely to see what some of the benefits are. Um, but there's a really good, there's lots of good research on this, um, but there was one particular paper that I thought I'd share with you, um, which I will in a second. But I, I did want to know though, first of all, how many hours do you think we need to volunteer to get those benefits? Take a guess. If you don't know, just take a guess. What do you think the research shows? So lots of benefits. Okay, we've got some good guesses coming in. One hour a week, one hour a year. Less than 10, 10, okay, good. Just take a guess, everybody, even if you don't know. Take a guess and I'm going to show you what the research says. 15 hours a week. Great, five hours a week, one hour. Fantastic. Okay, well, I'm going to share the research with you. Um, there is a great paper, and if anybody does want to read the research, I can send you the, the links to these papers afterwards. But there was some great research done um, 
by uh, some Australians and a US study done and it says that people who regularly volunteer show greater self-assessed psychological well-being, self-esteem, happiness and satisfaction with life and lower symptoms of depression and anxiety and with lower indicators of suicide risk. And I really thought, wow, doesn't that sort of speak to our culture and our, the state of our society at the moment after the pandemic, how important it is? And I mean, it's important any time for this, um, but particularly now after the pandemic, when we know that there is a lot of isolation and people's poor mental health after the pandemic and all the things that people have been experiencing in the last few years, um, how important it is for volunteering to be one of those uh, ways of being able to improve people's health and well-being. In fact, one of the papers talks about the fact that it is a viable public health intervention. And I really thought, wow, yes, I've never thought about it as a public health intervention. Um, but maybe it is, maybe it is. But then I read another paper um, that was actually published a little bit earlier in 2008. And they actually looked at, well, how many hours a week do we need to volunteer to get some of these benefits? Is it a one-off thing or do we need to do more often? And the research showed that you need to contribute more than 100 hours a year. So I don't know whether it matters, whether it's spread out over that time or whether it's, you know, regularly over the weeks. Um, but I thought, yeah, that's very interesting that we need to make sure that people are volunteering enough, but also not too much because there was a downside to actually people volunteering too much because we don't want to stress people. And there's that it's a really interesting article to make sure that there is a optimum amount of hours for people to gain the benefits, but not go into risk as well. We don't want people overwhelming themselves. Um, so yeah, I just thought this was very interesting research and I thought that this kicks us off really in terms mm -hmm. of thinking about what the national strategy is all about um, and why do we need a national strategy and in a moment Sarah's going to tell us why the, the vision is to make the, it the heart of Australia and this is just, I just think, uh, a good way to kick us off. So thanks everybody, um, great to have your thoughts on whether you agree with these benefits and this uh, optimum amount of hours. Now to introduce our panel then, uh, we have the lovely Sarah Wilson. Sarah is from Volunteering Australia and has been uh, leading some of the work around the national strategy. So welcome Sarah Wilson, the National Strategy Director at Volunteering Australia. Uh, welcome to Tanya. Tanya Carlos is from the Origin Foundation, a senior manager there working with a lot of corporate volunteering, uh, co corporate volunteers from Origin, but also working with a lot of organisations that work with corporate volunteers. And then we have Melanie Oppenheimer, who is the Honorary Professor at um, ANU, but also, uh, Melanie, you're a historian and an author. You've done a lot of research looking at volunteering. And I, I just, obviously, as a fellow academic, I really love the whole idea that we've got some really great research to back up what we know about volunteering and the benefits of volunteering. And then we've got Brad, who's the CEO of Volunteering Gold Coast on the Gold Coast and working with many, many organisations that utilise volunteers, but also volunteers themselves and really understanding the power and the benefits of volunteering and having this national strategy. So um, yes, these are beautiful pictures of them in real life. I just really wanted uh, you to get to know these lovely people who are volunteering their time to chat with us today. So I'm going to really just kick off the conversation by asking Sarah if you can tell us some of the background to the national strategy. How did it come about? You know, who was involved? Can you come and summarise it for us so we can get that sort of background for anybody that doesn't know how, it, how it's come into being? Yeah, of course. So um, Volunteering Australia in mid-2021 were funded by the Australian Government Department of Social Services to lead the development of the national strategy. So they, the Australian Government really saw that um, we'd seen sustained decline in rates of volunteering for a long period of time coming um, through COVID. We had the research we commissioned with the ANU that was demonstrating that people who were stopping volunteering um, were suffering, you know, greater psychological distress than people who were able to continue. Um, and 
combined with all of the data that had been coming out for, for successive um, censuses and uh, general social surveys, um, the Australian government were really keen to figure out what we could do to create a future for volunteering where it could thrive. So we um, took on that project and really thought about how do we make sure this is something that is meaningful, evidence-based, um, represents the views of uh, a range of different stakeholders. And we tried to take a co-design approach as much as possible throughout the year of the development of the strategy. Um, and we built around that some really important mechanisms for sort of testing and validation. So we had a council, which uh, Melanie was representative on, also a research working group, which Melanie did chair as well, um, and a couple of other working groups in corporate volunteering and volunteer management, as well as volunteering policy, just to make sure that every time we were hearing something from the ecosystem, which was also a term we coined as part of the strategy, which people seem to love or hate, um, but just to validate and make sure that we were hearing people correctly and capturing a really diverse set of views. So over the course of the year, and many people on this call were part of that co-design process, uh, we went through a variety of stages of gathering information, presenting it back, um, and ultimately through a core design team of um, about 25 different experts from across the ecosystem, we pulled together the draft that turned into what is now the National Strategy for Volunteering. So even though we did it in a very compressed time frame, I think beginning to end of the substantive work was about 10 months, uh, which is huge for a national project. We still managed to talk to thousands of stakeholders. Most people participated more than once, which just goes to show the not just the enthusiasm, but the incredible generosity of people who gave their time to the project uh, generally, um, in a sense, volunteering, even if that was through work, it was always on top of their day job and in addition to their day job. And we came out with the strategy that we have today. So it was a really exciting process. And I think one of the really powerful outcomes of the co-design process was, yes, we have a national strategy, but more than that, it feels like to me that I'd love to hear people's views on this, especially someone like Brad, who's been around um, in the ecosystem for a while. I feel like for the first time, we kind of brought everyone together um, and irrespective of the challenges we face and some of the, you know, sometimes competing views about things, we finally have this agenda for volunteering for the next 10 years. That is a basis and a starting point for us to continue uh, the, the good work that we do. But I think that um, through the, the process of last year, we've really been able to connect in with communities and people and groups that we've never been able to before. Um, and that's definitely continued to happen since the launch in February. So um, in some ways, that outcome was almost more important than the strategy itself, because now we have the right people having the right conversations um, and a really important starting point for what happens next. Yeah, fantastic. So Brad, is the co-design process the right way to go for something like this? Um, and please, yes, everybody online, if you were involved in the process, please put in the chat how you were involved and if you found that an inclusive process. Brad, what are your thoughts? Yeah, look, I think it would be hard to speak against the idea of co-design not being the right process for, for something like this. Um, and you know, we were we were obviously involved in the in the process. Had a great opportunity to do that um, in a former life. Uh, it sounds like a bit of an academic festival in terms of who's on the panel. In a former life, when I was involved in academia, one of the first things I would have done would have been gone to the back of the document and tried to figure out which groups were which were who were involved, who was represented, maybe whose voice wasn't as strong in it. Um, and I know that um, Volunteering Australia. You know, yeah, you have constraints in terms of what you can do and how far you can go in terms of that consultation. And I think Sarah and the team responded to some of the challenges that were coming out saying, you know, maybe not all the groups, maybe not all the um, regional communities and remote communities are trying to get involved. So there was certainly a little bit more, a little bit more um, uh, engagement in that sort of space as well. Um, if I were to have a, um, you know, a, a, maybe a, a criticism, I think the 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 document is extremely it's extremely well produced we're very grateful for it we absolutely need it and it's one of those awesome things i think where the timing was perfect in that um it was developed through COVID. it's not been something which has been policy before or setting before COVID, which now has to adapt um i think the challenges right now are you know it's a document that is voluntary in terms of being able to take it up so it has to be able to sway people's view of opting in if you like um but the new challenges that are really at the heart of volunteering and volunteering participation right now are seeing how this strategy and the associated actions that go with it respond to things like cost of living pressures which we are looking at for another two years um low unemployment rates, which have a really direct impact on volunteer participation, as well as some of those um, Commonwealth incentives, say, for 
older people to go and earn some money to top up their their superannuation and their their pension income um, and that competes with volunteering <clears throat> and then obviously things just like housing supply and, and the likes of that so you know volunteering sit, doesn't sit within a bubble it sits within real communities real places um, and that's probably the other shift since pre this strategy is um, you know we had a Morrison government that was focused on getting everyone online we've now got um an Albanese government, which is focused on place-based approaches to communities coming up with their own solutions. And some of the direction of the strategy has taken those cues from the Morrison government and moving forward. Um, so it'll be interesting to see politically how that engages with the strategy and what shape and adjustments that looks like. Yeah, now, Melanie, I just want to ask you that you were a part of the research working group and, and Sarah said, you know, there was an importance around being evidence based and to look at the research. How And there are many researchers doing work on volunteerism and sort of many perspectives from the research community. Um, how did the strategy really engage with academia and researchers? Um, thank you, Ruth. Uh, the strategy is really predicated around um, evidence-based research, research that was um, commissioned for the strategy directly um, and also based around research that was already in the public domain. Um, I think that's one of the strengths of the strategy, that it is that research is front and centre or it's behind it, it it's part of the framework of it. Um, previous, there have been previous national volunteering strategies. I was actually involved in the last one um, 10 or so, or so years ago. But basically, this the model that was used for, to create this one was very, very different. Um, and it was done under really difficult circumstances all through 2022, when we were still in the COVID pandemic. Um, so to actually be able to produce it now um, as we're coming out of COVID, but as Brad said, I support 100% everything you've said in the sense of um, volunteering can't be seen in, in its own little bubble. It's part and parcel of the Australian way of life and communities. Um, and in that sense, the challenge is now is how do we make it actually work? That's probably a question for a moment, but in terms of research, um, yes, the, the, the document is predicated around research but there's still a lot that we don't know, and there's it, it's very it is very piecemeal. Um, the research there's a lot of different methodologies. Nothing kind of actually really adds up. The data that we you know the ABS data we only the first national um, study um, was only done in the late mid 1990s. We actually don't have a lot of longitudinal data about volunteering. So that is one of the challenges I think that 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 we need to work on in the next five to ten years as part of the strategy. And that's one of the criticisms that, that I have about it. And uh, those who are on the strategy know full well my views here, but I'll share them in this panel again now, is that um, the national strategy, I wish that out of the um, 11 or so strategic um, sort of foci, um, research and research funding is not there. And I wish mm. that it was because really without the evidence-based research, you don't have a strategy, you haven't got anything to really leverage off. So for me, that's something that's still a work in progress that we need to identify and address. Thanks, Melanie. And Tanya, I know the Origin Foundation uh, was involved as well in the strategy. And so when people think of volunteering, often they do just think about community organisations and the volunteers that, you know, do get recognised in the community. But of course, there's this whole other wealth of volunteerism. Uh, many, much of it is informal, um, but then we have the corporate volunteers as well. So how important was it for you, I suppose, in Origin Foundation to recognise corporate volunteering and the importance of corporate volunteering. Yeah, well, um, another wonderful Ruth, as you know, Ruth Lee, yes. um, who was in the position that I'm in now, participated in um, in the strategy, and um, and she's now moved on. But look, for us as a um, corporate, we we know it's important to give back. It. I think about 
you know, what the the strategy is trying to achieve. And it's it's, you know, at the core, it's it's about people and people doing, you know, their the right thing for the community and the planet and aligns with Origin's vision of getting energy right for the customer community and planet. And so we see an opportunity here to be able to give back. Um, you know, we we have a workforce of 5,000 people and we also provide our people with unlimited volunteering leave throughout the year. So they have the opportunity to go off and volunteer in, either with our partners or with someone that is important, and, you know, an organisation that's important to them. We see all the benefits of um, what volunteering does for our employees. We see them um, more engaged. We we know that the, the health benefits that that brings and and they they genuinely just feel like happier people. So we you know we say that volunteering is part of our DNA, um, even though we are a corporate, and um, and it's something that we'll just continue to support and try to grow as much as we can. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so we're going to look at the vision then for any of you who haven't seen it or have um, you know not seen what the vision of it. Let's have a look at that. But before we do, Daryl had a question for you, Melanie. Uh, you've quite rightly brought up the idea that we do need further research, and obviously we're hoping that this will be an advocate now, a piece of advocate um, advocating for further research. But where does the research money come from? Where do we get that? those dollars to help us do the research. Any thoughts, quick thoughts um, on that for Daryl? Yes, thank you. Sorry, my chat's not working, so I, I couldn't respond to that question, Daryl. Um, a couple of sources. Obviously, the not-for-profit sector, that, that's really not the calling and the charities. You you have your own work to do. You have your own, you know, your own precious funds. Doesn't necessarily need to go into research. Where should it come from? It should come from government. It should come from the philanthropic uh, sector. Yes. Um, but really, I, I think this is a role for governments. It's not a, you know, it doesn't cost a great deal. This should be just part and parcel of, of the money that goes into scientific research, medical research, volunteering research comes next. Yeah, fantastic. Yep. And please always remember that community organisations can partner with universities. Uh, mm -hmm. They can't always do it without money. Um, but that they, those partnerships do often work when organisations want to do some research. Now, so the vision then of the strategy is that volunteering is the heart of Australian communities. And I thought I'd just start with you, Brad, because you are on the ground, you are working with organisations every day. How would we know that? Like, how would we know if that vision is being achieved? What does it look like to have volunteering as the heart of our communities any thoughts yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna lean back into some of the comments that um the two mel melody and mel in on the ch and the chat have made which has been around the idea of what does the evidence look like so in the absence of some um not clinical measurement per se but some sensitive measures that we want to be able to take um it's really hard to actually have that discussion and tell people what it looks like beyond you know, participation numbers, hours contributed. So um, in my experience, very few organisations have had um, the inclination or the requirement to be able to put in, say, outcome measurement tools, look at pre-post data in terms of volunteer health or participant health and things like that. Um, and that is, that, is, that is holding us back. Um, but it's really important that those tools are pertinent to what your organisation does, but we find some degree of commonality so that as a sector, we can actually look across different organisations and say, why does Volunteering South Australia get a better outcome than Volunteering Gold Coast in this space, All right? That's that's the that's the gold gold piece for, for me. Um, I, you know, there's obviously just the visual of uh, communities actually seeing the act of volunteering take place, um, whether that's, you know, on the Gold Coast with volunteers supporting um events, uh, whether it's delivering involved in service delivery like us to help people that are lonely or isolated to, to connect. Um, there's so many ways in which we can kind of see it happening. Um, but in some ways, that diversity of the ways that it happens is uh, it's diminishing some of that voice. We need to be able to aggregate it up. Yeah. Melanie, I'd like to ask you why this is important. Like, why is volunteering to be, because it's a really large statement, it's a big hairy goal, isn't it, for volunteering to be the heart of our communities. But why does it need to be so big? Why does this need to be this big audacious goal? 
Um, thank you, Ruth. Because volunteering is a, is an integral part of our democratic traditions. It's it's an in integral part of democracy. And if we want to have a thriving um, democratic um, Australia into the future, we need to we, we need to recognise volunteering, what it does, um, and uh, you know, a healthy, thriving dem democratic state has a healthy, thriving volunteer base. Now that doesn't, and, and going back to that very first question that you had about what are the benefits of volunteering, well I like to think about well, what, what would happen if we didn't have our volunteers today? Um, you, you know, there'd be amateur sport. Saturdays would be completely different, you know, there would be no sport across the country. Um, our beaches wouldn't be patrolled. Um, associational life would not exist. There'd be no rural agricultural shows. Um, no local museums. And this is particularly important for rural and regional Australia, whose yeah. basic infrastructure is completely surrounded by the voluntary work that people do, and they don't even recognise it half the time. They just do it. Um, bushfires wouldn't be attended to. The Franklin Dam would be would have been built. The Sydney Rocks would not exist today if we didn't have advocates, uh, for volunteers going out there trying to save those spaces, the environment and then the, the urban spaces of the 1970s Australia. Um, you know, just, you know, what would life be like without Lifeline? Just just to give you an idea. So that's the idea. We've got to think about it in those terms. Um, and we have all those things, right? But they're struggling at the moment. And this is a really good opportunity framed around this strategy document, which is really rigorous, really informed, um, really weighty, um, but we need to now um, take that, take those words and actually really make them, um, put them into play. So, so in terms, that's why it's important. It's critical. It's actually critical. And, the, and I actually think that the volunteering is struggling at the moment because we as a society are struggling at the moment with the things that Brad talked about in the beginning because, because the cost of living, the inflation, the housing crisis, all these things are directly impacting on people who probably can't afford to volunteer anymore. Mm, yeah. So let me just ask everybody in the room and please put in the chat, you know, what do you think life would be like without volunteers? Like, can we even imagine a community that didn't have the opportunities to volunteer? What would that look like? I'm, I'm just really interested to see. Or perhaps you just want to put in the chat, you know, some of the achievements that some of your volunteers have made. Are there things that we need to recognise more through volunteering? What 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 has been achieved? I'd love to just see it in the chat if you want to have a have share um, what you think the achievements are or what life would be like without volunteer. I, I, I think there's a really bold statement to make around this, which is, um, you know, society and communities in Australia would not function without volunteers. Yeah, the economic benefit, the social benefit has been well costed out through the state of volunteering reports. The government knows it. All the small charities, you know, we support 115 charities as members. Um, all of the work that they do, if that wasn't supported by volunteers, would have to be picked up and either serviced by hospitals if it's health related because people can't get the right level of intervention and support to stay well at home. Um, GPs, local councils, it would it would grind the country to a halt. So that cost benefit analysis is just like huge, um, but it's very hard to actually cost out what volunteers actually contribute. Um, Tanya, do you do that or do you try and do that? Because I mean, you work with corporate volunteers. Um, is there a sense of the importance of trying to cost out, you know, what that means for that you're giving to the community as a corporate? Um, we don't necessarily cost it out at, um, at the foundation. Um, we probably, what we're trying to measure more is what our impact is versus our um, costs that we're, we're actually saving, um, whether it's for the, you know, for the community or the organisation. So it's more about what sort of other impact we're having. Yeah. But it was interesting yeah. when I went to the National Volunteering Conference early this year. I mean, I love to volunteer and it was um and and there were things that really blew my mind because I've got a young son and my husband coaches his basketball team and it was when they started talking about, you know, the actual cost of and I do the the score bench every week and you know, we don't view it as volunteering, but it really is, right? And when they started putting the figure on what that would cost, if you took all of that out and just as Brad is saying, 
Um, and Melanie's saying it will just bring everything to a halt, wouldn't it? Because we actually don't view it as volunteering, but it is. And there, there is actually a cost involved because you have to start paying the bench, the scorekeepers and the coaches. Um, then, you know, it does make a massive impact. And it's it's a really interesting, you know, um, thing to highlight. Yeah, in fact, um, at ACPNS yesterday, we were talking about the Commonwealth Games and Brad, you were there during the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast and we were talking about all the volunteers and what it would have cost to have actually paid for those volunteers at the Commonwealth Games, you know, and how much more uh, the Games would have cost if we hadn't have had uh, volunteers. So were Brad volunteers very important at the Commonwealth Games? Yeah, and look, we've been part of the conversation around looking at the... Um, uh, the legacy planning coming from the 2032 Olympics. So all those lessons that have come through from the Commonwealth Games are kind of being revisited. Um, and there's some really pragmatic things that can be done to improve um, not only how we get volunteers from events like that, but how we retain them. And one of the key things that many Commonwealth Games and Olympic movements have failed to do well is to get the privacy settings right at the start of recruiting volunteers so that you can actually share their data with consent through to other organisations like all of those on the chat here um, that want to be able to access and make use of those volunteers if they're willing. So if you don't get that right, and particularly if you don't match up the privacy requirements to what's sitting in European law where the requirements are far more stringent, and that means if you get one European volunteer coming to the Olympic Games, we're subject to European law, um, you have to be able to think all those things out right now and get that right. Yeah, lots of compliance. And I mean, that's good to take us in this uh, idea that there are risks involved in volunteerism. And many organisations do find that there's a lot of compliance and a lot of policy and procedure. And sometimes organisations just don't have the capacity to do all of that, to then be able to engage volunteers. So, um, you know, uh, Sarah, can you tell us maybe a little bit about, you know, how we actually make this possible for volunteerism to be more of an opportunity when many of the smaller organisations that need volunteers have to comply with so much legislation or, or compliance? Is there a way uh, that we can work through that? What are the challenges, I suppose, that you're seeing organisations face? Yeah, so it was probably the single most common thing that came up in every conversation I had last year was that the compliance and administrative burden of volunteering is just getting to a point where for some organisations it's completely untenable. Some organisations told me that they don't think they'll exist in a year's time because they simply cannot recruit volunteers to volunteer to do all the, the administrative stuff. And this comes back to the importance of the vision and the reason that volunteering needs to be at the heart of Australian communities. And it comes to the point that Brad just made about the legacy of things like Commonwealth and Olympic Games. If volunteering is, the, is at the heart of Australian communities generally, genuinely, what that means is that every conversation we have in this country considers volunteering in the first instance. It doesn't treat volunteering as a way to save money I'm I'm I say this uh, this is my unpopular opinion not necessarily unpopular but sometimes controversial opinion I really don't care about the economics of volunteering I've never met a single volunteer in my life who has told me they volunteer to save the government money that is not why we do it and I sometimes I'm challenged by the focus on that I'm challenged by us talking about how much volunteering gives to the economy because it's not why any of us do it and it's you know a product of the society that we live in um yeah. I'll have to finish if that's okay please Melanie um, yeah. And the reason that volunteering needs to be at the heart of communities is because change. we are constantly on. considering volunteering in the first instance. It means that things like compliance and regulation requirements will be designed with us in mind rather than us coming in at, at, at a later stage and having to retrofit those things. And, you know, to Brad's point about privacy, if volunteering was, was a critical part of things like big sporting events, um, these questions would be satisfied and answered in the first instance because they would be involving experts like us who would be able to say these are the things you need to put in place for this to be a really long-term um, thing that gives value back to the communities. And at the moment, we don't see that. We don't see volunteering being considered in policy design, in the design of regulation, in um, budgets and funding and things like that. Volunteering is often an afterthought. And the true cost of volunteering is not ever particularly considered in a lot of things. So the cost of managing volunteers is rarely ever something that is able to even be put into grant agreements and applications and things like that. And we need to change the conversation about that because if we don't build the capacity for more volunteers to be involved and we don't give organisations the support they need to build capability internally, 
then we can't recruit more volunteers because there's nowhere for them to volunteer. So it, that's, you know, the importance of this vision is really about how do we centre volunteering in society in a way that it is never an afterthought. Um, and then from there, we should see things like regulation and compliance become easier and more common sense uh, rather than completely risk averse so that we aren't unnecessarily constraining volunteering um, and stopping people from participating. Melanie, did you want to add to that? Yes, I did. And Sarah, I wasn't going to interrupt you. I was just sort of putting up my hand to say, oh, I'd like to go next. Um, um, the thing is, if it's not counted, it's not counted. So people aren't trying to put an economic value on volunteering to save the government's money or whatever it is. That's actually, I think, missing the point entirely. The, the reason that people go down that road to try and count the value of volunteering in dollar terms is simply because uh, it's counted, it is not counted. And all everybody, G, you know, politicians, everybody says that. We have to, in order for people to really kind of for the penny to drop, not only do volunteers need, need to maybe withdraw their labour or kind of a sort of discussion we've had about what would happen if the volunteers weren't there, yeah. but we need to put it within GDP terms. Because it, unless we do that and have that, you know, third level of accounting or whatever it is, they just won't take any notice. So we need everything that you've said, but over and above that, we need to recognise the economic value of it. And that is not to save government money. That is to show the government, yeah, this is how much you are saving because these people are volunteering their time, effort and energy for no remuneration. So for me, I, I disagree fundamentally with you. <laughs> I think it's absolutely critical that we have that data alongside all the other data that we have. And yeah. I actually disagree about the importance of that, but we have known for a very, very long time at a pure wage replacement cost, the value of volunteering in this country, and governments are very happy to talk about that publicly, but not happy to actually Put resourcing behind it and I think the other thing that is so difficult I'm a very very proud lifeline crisis supporter um, and you can't put you can't put a dollar value on the price of mm. local you can say oh it's worth $33 an hour if you were to pay someone but you can't put a price on the, the, the community and social impact and the individual impact on me to, to be part of sometimes what is a life-saving call and I'm really challenged by trying to put a dollar value around that because I just don't think that we can you couldn't I couldn't. I actually think that, you know, those structures are there already in terms of um, as ruthless as it sounds, being able to actually quantify what some of those things are. There's 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 some there's some really good good evidence around it. I know at the end of each financial year, um, our organization has a discussion around trying to comply with the accounting standards and actually capturing capturing, recording and quantifying um what our volunteer contribution is and we're an organization that has about 180 volunteers right um and so you know we have um landed on a piece where we've got an approach to that and we explain what that method looks like although there's debate um about that but the other thing that happens in that same space is we see other organizations that are utilizing volunteers some of them some of them peaks as well where um they won't record it because there's dispute around that and i think the other part of it is when we don't enter into that space we're kind of letting that discussion run away rather than tackling it look it's a fantastic conversation for me because i love talking to people about evaluation and also funding when you go now to do grant applications you are often asked to say how many volunteers are you going to use and what's the cost of those volunteers you know it's an in-kind contribution and nine times out of ten people are asking me well, how do I value that in a funding submission? Because, you know, whether it's philanthropic or government, they are asking what is the contribution of the volunteers? Now, uh, interestingly, Tanya, a lot of your volunteers are very skilled. I mean, they are offering, you know, strategy and the, the very specialised types of volunteering, um, whereas, of course, in other cases, it might be young people or it might be older people just serving cups of tea, whether it's not skilled volunteering, but both equally important. So I think there's a, yeah, another huge conversation around if we're going to try and value uh, volunteering, how do we do that when so many different types of volunteers are 
giving different types of uh, value to the community and the organisations. Tanya, any thoughts on that in terms of how to think about the expertise that people are giving? And interesting, um, Ruth, we actually have a such a broad range of volunteering um, at Origin. So we, like I said, we volunteer with our partners um, and we, with education being our focus, we might do some school outreach programs and, and we call them aligned. So we have aligned volunteering in relation to education then we have non-aligned where we do things that are probably a bit more social. So whether there's food poverty or we're you know, our people are um, volunteering with the big issue. Um, and then we have our skilled volunteering where we, you know, either our partners or other charities can come to us and say, hey, listen, we do want to write a HSC strategy or we've got a legal pro bono program, for instance. Um, but what's interesting too is we, we've had our CEO go and read books to Indigenous kids at the Gawara School in Sydney and he loved it and he would go, I think there was a period there where he was going every week. Now, um, his skill that he was providing obviously was just to be able to read and help the kids read for an hour. So, you know, we were have we've had um, executive GMs go out and do um, stuff with the big issue and the CEO they do the CEO um, big issue day or um, to help try and promote it so we have such a breadth of what we do and um, and people from all different parts of the business will do things like cook for fair share um, but then they might be able to provide their expertise and something you know in their area of um, you know where, where they're really skilled at um, that's really important for us, for people to be able to do things outside what they actually do at work and give back in other ways and in ways that are important to them. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Melanie, just a very quick summary then on what are some of the researches that we need, now need to do if we are going to use this strategy as a way of promoting the benefits of volunteering and why we need to engage people more in volunteering. Can you give us just a sense of maybe what is some of the research that you'd like to see happen? Um, well, one of the good things that the strategy did on page 71, just in case if you want to kind of go through it, there's um, a list of research gaps because, of course, we need, you know, there's a lot more research that needs to be done and ongoing research. Um, and so that the sort of things are sort of volunteering in regional, uh, rural and remote Australia. I'm actually involved in a, an ARC linkage that's looking exactly at that because I mean, curiously enough, when you actually go and look at some of the volunteering um, research that's been done, it's generally on urban Australia. Um, it doesn't actually specifically look at rural and regional Australia. I mean, sometimes there is some work, um, but, but there's not actually very much when you actually dig into it. And so that's something that um, we really, that, that, that's a gap and that was identified um, and it's listed in the strategy. Um, you know, all the other sorts about um, relationships between volunteering and gender, that's an ongoing sort of topic. Um, volunteering in First Nations communities, um, addressing climate change, these sorts of things. Um, so th there's, there's, there are, there's a lot of research that we still need to do, um, but, but one of the things that I would really like to see is um, a bit more of a focus on pulling together some of the volunteering research, that there's one place where people can go. I'm interested in setting up some sort of centre for volunteering um, based around sort of similar with the QUT, what you've got there, or the consortiums of universities like the Centres for Social Impact, but something that actually has volunteering in, in the title um, and that can really focus the researchers. Uh, VA is doing that at the moment um, to some degree, but they seem a little reluctant to kind of really go all out because I think in a sense one of the things that is in, useful and important about this volunteering strategy is that Although it is an, it, it, it's involved the whole ecosystem, um, you do need someone to drive it. You know, like it really is important to have a, a single sort of focus. Focus And VA has done that very successfully to date. Um, the proof will be in the pudding whether that it can continue. So I think research is, is, is something that really needs to be thought about carefully um, and in terms of, of research funding. Yeah, and Mel has said, you know, about uh, COVID and how COVID affected volunteering and how we've got to uh, get back, you know, to uh, more optimum levels, I suppose. Um, yeah. That's a very um, good research topic. Yeah, the other thing to, to, to just to mention here is that we are not alone. This is happening internationally as well. Everyone coming out of COVID 
is experiencing the same problems with their volunteer numbers declining in the UK, um, the USA, places where we sort of generally compare ourselves. So we're not alone here. It would be useful to look at ex outside of the country to find out what other countries are doing to address it. When, um, but, yeah, the, coming out of COVID, it, it's some really challenging questions that we need to look at. And we need to give ourselves a bit of um, on the back in the sense of this is not going to happen overnight. This is, this is going to take us at least two years or more, um, and we need to be able to reach out and help those organisers that are really struggling at the moment, um, like in aged care and things like that, because there are areas that are really struggling for volunteers, and there are other areas that aren't doing too badly. So we need sort of some kind of community sort of help, um, at, you know, getting those volunteers out to the areas that, that it's really needed. But this is two, two, three years. Half the strategy, the time of the strategy, is going to be needed in getting back um, to what we sort of had before. But it's going to be different. The landscape will be different anyway. Yeah, very topical for me. I have a 14-year-old um, and he started his Duke of Edinburgh award and he has to volunteer as part of that award, which I'm obviously super excited about. Um, but I've been going, okay, what are you going to volunteer? How are you going to volunteer as a 14-year-old? Um, and I'm going to come to you, Brad, actually, and have a chat with you about that. Um, but we've been thinking, you know, isn't it important for these young people who are mm. doing Duke of Edinburgh, but many are not, um, who are made to think about, well, volunteering is a community service and I need to start that early because I know, because obviously I'm, I agree with volunteering, uh, but if I can start him volunteering young, then it's probably going to be embedded into his DNA throughout his life. So family volunteering and volunteering as young people, that's a really big interest for me, mm. which I'd love to see more uh, research done on. Um, Craig, did you, is it Craig from Sit and Chat? Did you have a question? Yes. Um, oh, yeah. I just wanted to um, just listen. Amazing speakers. You're very, very informative. We have a, a charity over here in Brisbane. Um, we when we first started, we found that a lot of charities working by themselves or going after their grants by themselves. I thought it was all going to be like kumbaya kind of group coming together. Yeah. So, but. So what we did is we uh, sat down and we worked out a, a marketing strategy with what a lot of people were saying to us, I want to volunteer, but I've got to fill out the forms, I've got to do that, and I don't know how the computer online, so people don't do it, I just want to help someone. So we come up and we just had a meeting with the Lord Mayor here in Brisbane and then Kim Marks, the Parks Committee. So you're going to start seeing these aluminium tables that you see on the beach fronts, the long ones with the long seats, or you see in parks, you're going to start seeing orange ones around the place. And what we've done, the deal is we have a big plate that goes on the top, which is also orange, laser engraved words, sit and chat conversation table. Anyone who sits yeah. at this table is now open to have a conversation with anyone else who sits at this table. But also what we've added is a QR code on the bottom. So now any charity, lawyer, whatever, whoever wants to give free advice, scans that code, up comes the calendar, now charities working together because smaller charities don't have a base. Yeah. So now they can utilise our tables, put their name, date and time, what they're offering, what service. Now everyone going to the same place looking for different charities now can be in different areas all working together. We also, oh, yeah. said, to, we also said to the Lord Mayor, you guys drop a fortune on functions and events, but you don't concentrate on that one person who's by themselves still lonely going to the event. We want conversation tents like the medical tent, orange, with a table inside, two volunteers, two flags, like Kmart greeters. Hi, how are you? Introducing you to people. Friendly city, great for our games. And that's what we were. Love doing. it. Thank, Love thank it. Thank you for letting me share. No, thank you. And, you know, you've you've highlighted the importance of innovation in this space, uh, which is not, wasn't on my list of questions. But I really think, again, that to see people really doing innovative things to bring people together, uh, promote volunteering, and that is going to lead me to this next um uh, sort of question to the panel, which is again, then how are we going to use this strategy? How are we going to do it, use it to do things like innovation, bring more people together, promote volunteering more innovatively? Uh, does anybody have a quick thought on that? Um, how are we actually using the national strategy? Maybe Sarah can kick us off with that. You know, what, what are your hopes, I suppose, for people to take this strategy and utilize it? Yeah, so the way that we design the strategy is actually so that 
it works at multiple different levels. So obviously this is what we want to do with volunteering holistically, but the 11 strategic objectives that sit under each of the focus areas um, were designed in a way that you can actually use them in your own organisation. So every single one of those strategic objectives is something that an organisation, no matter whether they involve volunteers or they're a university or they're in government, can use to actually look at how they are supporting volunteering. The only one that needs a slight tweak, depending on your um, circumstances, is, is strategic objective 3.1, which is around making volunteering a cross-portfolio issue in government, but it just means making it a cross-portfolio issue in your organisation. So if you are a volunteer involving organisation that does lots of different things, is volunteering across your entire organisation. And so in that way, people can actually use the national strategy to assess their own programs. They can use it in local advocacy. Um, and what we really hope is that people will do that. They'll have a look at how they might be meeting those strategic objectives internally. But also we want this to be an advocacy tool for anyone who's going to their local government, their state government, or to federal government to say, you know, if we can do these things, if we can achieve these 11 strategic objectives, it will collectively improve volunteering in this country and enable it to thrive. So in that way, it was intentionally designed to be something that is uh, adaptable in different circumstances. Um, and, you know, we really hope going forward that everyone will be an advocate for the national strategy and, and even if there are certain things within that that don't necessarily directly apply to an organisation, um, they apply to, to so many others that might need that help and support. Um, so in that way, we really want it to be a document that people can take with them when they're having conversations to say, these are all the reasons why you need to strategically invest in volunteering. Yeah, like sit and chat when they go to see the Lord Mayor of Brisbane. Mm -hmm. uh, you can take the strategy along and say, look, this is why it's important to invest in new and innovative ways of getting people to understand how volunteers are useful in the community. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So it's a document, uh, Sarah, that we can not only uh, use to guide us, but to support us in going off and advocating for more uh, resources, research, etc. cetera. Um, Tanya, have you thought about how you're using using it at Origin Foundation? What what are the ways that you're going to be yeah, using yeah. it? Well, I'm just in the process now developing our new volunteering strategy for the foundation. So, you know, this has come in really handy for me because it helps to guide um, me and the foundation on what that might look like and how we're going to better engage and why it's important um, that we that we do volunteer. So for me, it's, um, it's almost going to become a bit like my Bible to help guide me on our own strategy. So yeah, I love it. Um, I think it's, it's, you know, it's at a great time for me. Um, yeah. While I just asked Melanie, because I, I, I see you, you've got something to say about this. Um, can everybody in the chat please put how you intend to use the strategy within your organisation? I'd really like to see other people's views on how we're going to use it. We do not want this to be another strategy that sits on the shelf. Okay, too many strategies just get written and uh, don't get used. And so I really want to hear from everybody online today. How are you going to use the strategy? But Melanie, do you have any other ideas of how we can actually use it? Well, I think we need to use it as a platform to revitalise the whole volunteering, the whole ecosystem. And But I think we need to reimagine how we're going to do that. And one of the things I really like that UK Big Help Out Day that they had on the 8th of May, um, which was a public holiday, um, National Day of Volunteering. Wow. I think that would be <clears throat> a really, really cool thing for us in Australia to do. Um, towards the end of the year just to really um, reinvigorate and we can use the strategy because I mean it's a really important document and we can make it live by through this what you know the big help out day and notice how they didn't call it volunteering right so it's just the big help out because that means that it kind of engages yeah. informal and formal volunteering and and just getting back to your question about um, you know, the regulations and things like that. I think that's why informal volunteering has continued to grow and formal volunteering has declined because people are just, they're not, they can't be bothered. And we've heard a lot of people talking about that in different ways. So they just, you know, they just, they might continue to volunteer, but they're just doing it differently. Yeah. And just to finally ask Mel, answer Mel's question about the people aren't coming, bouncing back to volunteering, we had the great resignation from the paid labour force during COVID, right? Um, that has impacted on volunteers as well. Unpaid labour, paid labour, it's not, there's actually not yet a great difference, okay? There's a great resignation. People have reassessed their lives. People have reassessed what they're doing, how they're living, and their volunteering has, I think, been impacted just in a way. 
Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. So, Brad, um, just want to turn to you then in the last minute or two, really then about our action planning, because if we're going to walk away from this conversation going, okay, we now have a great strategy. Uh, we now know that it's, be, it's, we want it to be used. We want it to be a tool, a framework, a guidebook, even a Bible. Uh, you know, we want it to be something that's really helpful to us. Um, what do you think or what can you encourage everybody online, Brad? to do uh, going forth as of today? Yeah, look, I think the the, the point I'd reiterate that um, Melanie just made is, you know, we're, we're in a period now where this is probably the biggest single disruption to volunteering that we've seen, and that is an opportunity as opposed to a threat, right? So this is a chance to make some big changes to move faster than we have in the past and rethink what volunteering looks like. It's not going to come back the same. Right? And if you think it is, then it's going to be a really difficult journey for you. Um, one of the things I think that's important to follow is just, uh, you know, the strategy exists within an ecosystem and there's a whole range of other government policies, actions and funding that are, that are taking place. Um, I think the strategy needs to move faster to seeing funding and activity come down the pyramid. So at the moment, it's really powerful in terms of making sure that volunteering Australia and the state peaks are, well, are really well um, set up. But once you get to that lower levels of the ecosystem, the volunteer support system where we sit in as a VRC, now unfunded, where volunteer involving organisations sit and volunteers are, that funding is not coming down fast enough. Um, and we haven't quite got things lined up as well. So um, the conversation around uh, research, um, the work that we need to do, We've got activity coming out of VA, which is, say, supporting a better understanding of working with special needs groups in the volunteer space. Uh, but we're already commissioning projects through the state peaks around improving volunteering in that space. So we've, we've kind of got the cart in front of the horse. We just need to realign those things as well. Um, I would love to see, um, and it's in the plan that um, Sarah and the team have created around that interim review to make sure that the design of the policy and where the strategy and where it's going is right because of some of those things that have been been moving. Um, and the other part is very much the theme of this conversation, which is you got to talk about volunteering and you've got to talk about the strategy all the time. Yes, yes. Um, I would, I'm going to do a poll right now. So you should all see a poll popping up. And as you're doing that poll, I would love to know how are you thanking volunteers during National Volunteer Week? Because we do, I agree with Brad, need to be talking about our volunteers all the time. We need to be thanking them. We need to be recognising them. And I'd really love to know what are you doing this week? Is it a morning tea or is it something different to that? How are you talking about volunteering during this very important National Volunteering Week? And then I'm also having a look at what you're saying, you know, will we be able to make volunteering the heart of Australian communities? I thought I'd just throw that up as a poll to you to see is this, you know, a big audacious goal, but can we do it? Is it possible putting all these strategies in, or, you know, the mini strategies, the sub strategies into place? Um, and can we do that by working together and being innovative? You know, having these really innovative strategies, uh, social media, getting out there and talking about the power of volunteering more, um, talking to our politicians, of course, getting more funding for research. You know, there are so many ways I think that we we would help us. And I'm just wanting to know if this is inspiring you and if you feel it is achievable. So, and I'm loving reading what you're doing to celebrate volunteers this week. Um, Oh, Colleen said, I believe volunteering already is the heart of our Australian communities. It's a beautiful sentiment. I agree. Um, and uh, so, yes, you're absolutely right. And I think Melanie said it's part of our DNA. So it already is, you know, a very important. But we've got to get more people out there volunteering and more 14-year-old boys like my son, because I reckon that's going to be a very important thing if our young people can get out there volunteering more. So we need to make it more possible because uh, when the young people are saying, I want to volunteer and it's not, the 14, sometimes they're younger than 14, uh, when they say they want to volunteer and I say, no one's going to take you on, you're too young, they, their insurance won't cover you. <laughs> um, and then they're like, oh, okay, well, nobody wants me as a volunteer when I'm young. Um, so I think we've got to change that um, and try and look for more opportunities to get those young people in there.
Right. Oh, beautiful. Well, we've got 76% of you saying yes, we will be able to use this strategy and uh, get that vision for us. That's fantastic. 4% are not so enthusiastic about it. And 19% are still not sure. All right, so we've got to get you guys over the line, I think, Sarah. Got to work hard at all these people who are not quite convinced yet and might be still wondering whether there's enough support and funding and research out there to help them. Um, please, uh, Sarah, can you just land us, you know, finish off today with saying, can people reach out to Volunteering Australia if they've got more ideas or have some more thoughts on this? What's what's the communication like? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there is on the National Strategy website, which is uh, national strategy, national, volunteeringstrategy.org.au, you think I know that by now, um, that you can, that our email is on there, which is just nationalstrategy at volunteeringaustralia.org. Um, there's also a, a contact us form that comes straight through and all of that will land in my inbox. Um, uh, people also have my email, it all goes to the same place, but you can reach out to any of us at any time if you've got ideas or you want to be involved. Um, and when Zach starts in a couple of weeks, we will start planning for the four out, uh, sorry outputs from the establishment phase that need to happen in the first year. Um, and that's when we'll probably come back out to the ecosystem and really look for people to be involved, um, particularly in the design of that first three-year action plan, which will build on everything we heard last year. So for anyone who did come and put up the thousands of post-it notes at all of our consultations, they are all under my desk. We haven't lost any of that great stuff. We'll be building from there, but it's an opportunity for us to really make sure, to Brad's point that we're putting in, you know, uh, review points and making sure that this process is something that actually creates tangible outcomes and this doesn't end up being a strategy that sits on a shelf. Yeah. And in 10 years time, we come back and realize we haven't achieved anything. So please stay engaged. Um, please continue to send through critical feedback as well. We really, I definitely really love uh, constructive criticism because we don't know what we don't know. Um, and it is such a diverse ecosystem that we need to make sure that we're capturing the views of different people. Um, and in some ways, you know, the document reflects who we heard from. So if you don't feel like it reflects you, it might be that we didn't ca accurately capture a voice or a particular part of Australian society or communities. And we want to know about that. So stay engaged um, and, you know, reach out at any time if you have ideas, particularly if you're doing something to implement the strategy in your organisation yeah. and your communities, because those examples we can highlight for others to see what they can be doing. Um, and we want to try and capture all of that to actually demonstrate how the strategy is creating change on the ground, I suppose. So, um, you know, feel free to get in contact anytime. Um, Absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree more. That's what's very inspirational is hearing what people are doing and seeing what innovation is occurring across our communities so that we can share that learning. And we can certainly as academics look at that and research those case studies, etc. So please feel free um, to share what you're doing and inspire others. Right. Well, we have come to the end of today. So I would love you to all give a round of applause somehow, do a little emoji to our panel today. Thank you so much to uh, our panel for sharing their ideas and thoughts. But thank you to you all for coming today, being part of the conversation. Um, I really hope that you've uh, enjoyed the discussion, robust discussion around this. Um, and of course, we've got lots more discussions to come up around volunteering and the value of volunteering, etc. So keep an eye on ACPNS research, stay in touch with ACPNS. And um, if you would like to come Come along to another team buns, uh, stay in touch with me and we would love to have you along another time. So thanks again everybody, Tanya, Brad, Sarah, Melanie and everybody else online today. Thank you for coming and uh, hope to see you soon. I like that, that little, that little heart. <laughs> okay, all right, see you everybody.